Perfect. So, yeah, firstly, sorry about that. We'll, uh, we'll get going with this straight off the bat. So, um, last week we spoke about uh, the platform, the ability to roll your ankles and your line. So, we got a couple of questions from last week. We're going to come on to them. Just a very, very quick summary. The, the platform um, is what allows you to ski, basically. Um, so it allows you to roll your ankles. It allows you to balance. It allows you to move. Um, it allows just about everything. So we're going to look at this next photograph quickly. Um, Lindsay Vaughn Ski and GS. So if you were to split right in half between the red gate and the blue gate, um, the picture of Lindsay there, you can see her platform. If you were to look at her from the very front on, from very front on, um, our shins would be absolutely parallel. The distance, like we said last week, between the tips of our skis, our feet and her knees um, would be exactly the same, which is exactly what we're looking for. We're going to come onto that a little bit later. Um, so that's just an example of the highest level um, basically putting everything together um, on, in, that, in that principle. So because she's got the platform, she can roll her ankles. As a result, she can keep the speed up. Um, and as you see her, she's at the gate, she's aiming above the next one. So a couple of questions that we got from the last session. Why is the platform important? Um, it allows you to, to ski quickly. That's the bottom line. Um, if you look at the photograph, um, one of the under-14s at Stoke, at one of the camps in October, um, her shins are parallel in that position. Um, she would be able to jump, she'd be able to step, uh, shuffle her feet, everything. It's a, instead of being a defensive position, um, the platform is really offensive. It really allows you to, to want to go faster, um, which is perfect, absolutely perfect. It's what we're looking for. Um, how can you tell if your platform's good? It's, that's a good question. Um, a, a really good question. It's something that Christy from Snowsport Scotland is going to go into in a little bit more detail um, in a second. Um, how can I practice rolling my ankles? Another great question, and it is really, really simple. Um, if you've got skis on your feet, if you're on dry slope, uh, one mat wide. Uh, maybe go halfway up the slope. One mat wide. Just roll your ankles onto that big toe like we spoke about last week. Um, if you haven't got skis on your feet, um, it's exactly the same movement. So you should have an equal distance between your feet, your knees, and obviously your hips. Um, and from there, it is literally a case of just rolling both ankles at the same time um, to get those shins looking like window wipers. Um, we're we're going to come on more to that. Um, and actually, the next slide, we'll, we'll look at that as well. Is the highest line always the best? This is a coach's nightmare of a question. The, the answer is no. Um, if you're on the flats and the course is very straight or you're coming towards the finish, you can straighten that line off. Um, but the only reason you can is if your line was better higher up the course. So um, like we spoke about last week, line is arguably 75% of why athletes win races. Um, from under 12s right the way up to the World Cup, guys. Um, um, once you pass the gate, you aim above the next gate. That's what we were speaking about last week. Um, so, yeah, something different this week. We're going to speak to Christy. Um, Christy is one of the coaches at Snowsport Scotland in charge of the pathway. So she's going to speak to us uh, just for a minute or two about the skills quest. So um, for you guys that don't know a lot about it, this will be a really good learning point. Um, for coaches, parents, and athletes, this is a, a point that we can all um, that, that we can all learn from. So, Christy, I'll, I'll hand over to you for a minute um, just to let us know kind of what the Skills Quest is and, and what it's all about. No worries. Thanks, Razor. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to see so many people on tonight, um, and it looks like you guys have been discussing some really cool stuff. So. Yeah, basically the Skills Quest program was developed by a uh, US ski and snowboard and it's something that we've adopted here um, in the UK for, for quite a few years um, with kind of varying degree of, um, I guess, emphasis. But yeah, it's, it's a great um, tool. Um, basically, the skiing skills part of the program is a, is a tool which measures ski racing skills. So we use it in combination really with um, race results to give a more complete picture, I suppose, of a ski racer's progress 
and also to help them, I suppose, to kind of better focus um, their training or your training towards specific areas that you want to develop or the, the tool, I guess, would highlight that you should develop. So basically it promotes the fundamental skills as a basis for strong skiing technique and provides a tool where these skills can be taught, measured and also tracked over time. So it's not necessarily always used as an assessment. That's a really important point to make. You can use it for your own training to understand what you could look at to develop in relation to the fundamentals and to give you, I guess, a bit of focus and structure as to how to do that. So it's also a bit of a motivational tool as well. And it gives you some short term targets to work on and um, to help your overall skiing. So the drills themselves are sort of developmentally organized. And um, so basically they emphasize each of the, the four primary skiing skill areas or the fundamentals as we kind of refer to them. So pressure, edging, rotary and balance. Um, as the kind of developmental stage of, of, so as you get better or as you get older um, or, and stronger, the, the drills become more challenging. Um, the drills that are associated to each of these fundamentals become more challenging. So what you're expected to do or what you're asked to do becomes more difficult, but the level that you are expected to achieve within those um, drills, I suppose, remains consistent. So that's why it's really nice to use it um, from all the way from uh, when you first start ski racing all the way through until you're, you're racing this and, and beyond. So to use the skills uh, quest uh, tool, coaches would initially make an assessment as to where um, the athlete or where you are in that developmental phase. So that's generally based on your age and um, which keeps it quite simple, or it might be based on your growth and maturation. So perhaps you're a little bit bigger and a bit stronger um, than some of your peers and there, therefore you might enter at a different developmental stage, or perhaps you've, um, you've only recently just started or taken up ski racing um, and your coach might decide that they might want to start you a little bit earlier on the developmental phase and give you some time to catch up. Um, so yeah, your coach would make that assessment. And then this would obviously be translated into the skills quest assessment table where the appropriate tests or the drills for each of those four fundamentals are outlined at that phase. And so after carrying out those skills, um, it's really easy to see which of those you might be better at and which might be some areas that you want to develop moving forwards. And then, then it's up to the coaches really to say, okay, well, if you are really strong in rotary and balance just now, we might focus the next couple of weeks of training for you on pressure and edging, and they'll give you a variety of different drills that I'm sure they have at their fingertips to help you to get better at that particular um, fundamental. So then you can start to develop towards more mastery in each of those skills. So um, how it's kind of assessed, it's really simple. So each of the, um, the drills is assessed out of 10 and you get points. Um, deducted for where faults may, may be evident. Um, and obviously that scale or that rating remains the same for each of the developmental stages. So whether you're in stage one and you've just begun or whether you progress a little bit further through some of the stages, it, it's still the same scoring structure. Um, and that then is applied to an overall scoring table, which um, is out of 10. And that is also split up into bronze, silver and gold, which again is, is a really good tool to use um, I'm emphasizing in training as well, because it's it's quite good um, fun, I guess, to, to work towards bronze, silver and gold as you're working on each of your skills. So in the event that we might use something like this for testing, um, which has been done previously and, and we, we may look to do in the future, um, athletes would um, go through the, the specific drills at their developmental stage and then they would be given a score out of 10. And what would then happen is that you would kind of average those skills across, um, average those scores out across the, the full battery of tests. And then that would um, be assessed against a kind of benchmark. Um, and that benchmark may change depending on um, the selection policy or the selection criteria. So that's how it might, might be used. So that's basically it, Fraser. I don't know if anybody wants to ask any questions or if you want to ask any questions on it. Um, but I'm sure that, that also that you can circulate some of the materials around people so they can have a look at it. The document is really easy to, to use as a coach or to, to look at as an athlete or as a parent. Um, it's really easy to, to get to grips with it. But yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, yeah, perfect. No, that's, uh, I think that was pretty clear. So yeah, one thing that we're looking at as BSA um, that really appeals to us is that you can compare or you can track um, the guys from you know under 10s and 12s do the same test as these guys that are 14s, 16s, 18s, 21s uh, and beyond. 
Um, so yeah, I think the skills quest is a is a massive, massive thing going forward. Um, and the, the reason that it does compare is because it answers the, the majority of the questions on the slide there. Um, it looks at your technical ability, it looks at um, your skiing ability and, and to go from there. So I think it's, it's a really good thing to look at going forward, definitely. It gets you, um, it gets you some numerical data like in relation to your technique. And we all know in ski racing that a lot of pressure is put on us to perform in race conditions on one run. And sometimes we don't feel like we've managed to, um, I guess, put on our best show on that one day. And it's nice to be able to go back to some numerical data that's not related to your time going down a course, but it's related to how hard you're working on training on specific things that you want to develop so it's really nice to stay yeah like as you say oh I was a six which is I think it's good I can't remember off the top of my head but I was maybe a six in the autumn and now I've done the same drill again at the end of the season and I'm now more like an eight and that shows really really good progress over you know one particular training block so it's great and as you say you can then use that to start to create a profile um, and athletes can even get involved in that process themselves, which is really cool that you can leave that yourself and say to your coach, actually, um, Hope or Fraser or whatever, I was, I was only a, a five in this before and uh, I'd really like to get better at this. And by the end of this block, I want to be an eight. So can you help me get there? And it gives you some numerical like data to, to work towards. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think um, in terms of progress, that actually takes us pretty nicely on to the next point. So uh, hopefully everyone's still on the, the presentations and the photo on the left is uh, Dave riding when he was younger and the dry slope the photo on the right is Dave um, last year I think it was in Kitzbühel so it just goes to show that the skills that you learn um, albeit on the dry slope on the indoors on the alpine they're all transferable skills they all move across um, one way or another so yeah, it, this is, it's just all about building your skill base um, until you get to a point where you're able to put that down over, over two runs of slalom, two runs of GS, um, or, or if you move into speed, one run super G, one run downhill. Um, so building on the, the technical points, again, we're going to look at it as two technical points, one tactical point. Um, this week, we are looking at the progression. So we rolled the ankles. Um, Last week, now we're going to look at the progression of the knee. So I'll just give everyone just one minute, um, just have a really quick read of this uh, slide, and then we'll, we'll get rolling with the, the next progression. <clears throat> okay, so... This sounds like the easiest movement in sport. You, you've rolled your ankles and all you have to do, if you think about it, is keep that movement going and move your knees in at the same time. Now, when you're going 55 miles an hour down a slope and, you, and you're trying to do that within seven and a half, eight meters, it's difficult. So what does it look like? That, that's the first thing. Um, so, so all you athletes out there, what does it look like? It, we can speak about it and we can, we can talk about it. Um, for as long as we can, but uh, for as long as we want, sorry, but to visualize it, what, what does it look like? So if I was to roll, um, roll my ankles and put my knees in, after, uh, this is what it looks like. So the photograph up in the top right corner um, is one of, one of the fizz guys. You can see that his inside knee is really pushed in um, and his chins are parallel. Um, so, sorry, I'm just going to check who's there. Uh, if anyone is not, if anyone's not on mute, can you just make sure that you're, I think the microphones are coming through on uh, on everyone. So, yeah, sorry, back to you. If you look at, if you look at that photo. You, you uh, should be able to mute everybody on the meeting from your end as a host. Oh, can you? Yeah, that might be, might be an idea. How do you do? Two seconds, I will... I think I had to do it when I uh, set up the video, actually. I'll give it, I'll, I'll try and figure out as we go along. 
Um, so if we look at the photograph of one of the guys in the top corner, um, this one here, you can see, and obviously this is an extreme example, um, of his knees are almost on the snow. Um, so if you imagine window wipers of a car, it's, it's just such a good example. Um, window wipers of a car are always parallel, always. Um, that is exactly what we are looking for. If you were to stand at the bottom of a slope, someone was to ski, you're in the fall line, they're going to ski directly above you. If you were to just look at their legs, all you want to see is window wipers. Window wiper shins, window wiper shins. Um, it is, especially on the dry slope, probably one of the most important skills um, that keeps the ski carving, it keeps the speeds up, um, and it just allows you to keep that momentum. So this is a, an example that we use in the summer. So Hope, Tom and I, um, when we're on the dry slope, put a balloon. And people think, why, why on earth would you get a balloon? This is uh, an unbelievable drill. Um, because what it does is, if you push your, in, your outside knee, it's really easy to stand there and roll your knees. Now, your outside knee might go in further. That's called an A-frame. If you've got a balloon, you physically, your inside knee physically has to go in even further. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time with the, especially with the younger guys, um, kind of putting this into perspective, putting this into example um, with different objects. Now, whether it's a football, uh, whether it's a broken stubby, a balloon, um, it, it doesn't really matter. It's the concept that's there. So you can see by this person, this is George, one of the under 14s. Um, he's got the platform, his skis, his tips of his skis, his feet and his knees are the same distance apart. Um, and he's got that balloon that really helps him push that inside knee in. Um, so what, what does that do? What, why, why do we want to put your knees into turns? Why, why are we looking for parallel shins? I mean, the reason, the, the basic reason is to go faster. Um, for the parents and the other coaches on here, um, what we want to do is to bend the ski and then release the ski the same direction that we are traveling. So. Um, what that does is it allows us to turn faster, it allows us to turn on a shorter radius, and it allows us to turn in the direction that we want to keep the momentum going. So this photograph here, if we are to concentrate, I don't know if you guys can see me zooming in. Um, the outside ski, if we look at the, the bend on that outside ski there, um, that is more or less exactly what we're looking for. Now that will come with, with training, it comes with uh, both on-hill and off-hill training. Um, so this turn started by this person just rolling their ankles. It, it's that really simple movement, just rolling their ankles. And all that's happened is the knees have continued to go and the knees have ended up in that position there. They're like window wipers with the white shinnies. Um, it's actually a good use of the stickers and the shinnies there to see if they're parallel or not. Parallel or not. Um, but yeah, the, the end result is the bend in that outside ski. Um, if you can make a move forward after the turn. We're going to come, that, uh, come on to that next week. Um, in the direction that you want to travel, all that energy is going to be like a rocket booster towards that next gate or above that next gate. Um, so that is, that, that is the, bottom, that's the bottom line of rolling your ankles. You put your knees into the turn um, with the expectation that come the end of the turn, you're going to get that release of energy, that, that release of power um, that is going to A, make you ski faster, it's going to make you ski a better line, and it's going to make you a more confident skier. Um, so if you look at this picture again, the distance between the tips of the skis there, the feet and the knees, is probably pretty similar. Um, so that, that's exactly what we're looking for from the under-10s, um, and there are some under-10s that can get themselves into that position. Um, same with the Fizz guys, right the way up to the guys, um, Laurie, Billy, Dave, those guys, and Charlie, Tilly, um, on the World Cup. So technical point number one for tonight is the ability to include your knees in the turn. We're looking for parallel shins, um, and we're looking for the same distance between the tips of your skis, your feet, and your knees. That's a, a good rhyming one. Um, same distance between the distance between your feet, tips your skis and your knees. So, technical point one done. We're going to move on to the next point. Now, 
uh, last time we looked at line, all this kind of stuff. This time, we're going to look at the upper body. So, I mean, how, how important is the upper body in skiing? It's a, it's a good question. You can't, well, this is all open to interpretation. You can't win races based on your upper body. But you definitely can lose races because of your upper body positioning. So, what's class as the upper body? What well, upper body is from the hips up. Um, and what we're looking for is that everything from the hips up remains square. Now, what, what do we mean by square? Good question. Um, if I was to stand at the top of the slope and pick something at the bottom, sometimes it's a fence, sometimes it's a car, uh, sometimes it's even a person. Person holding an umbrella is probably the best one going. Um, we say to athletes, coaches say to athletes, try and keep your shoulders facing down the hill the, more or less the whole time. Now, you can see in the picture down on the bottom right, this person's got the platform, they've rolled their ankles, they've got parallel shins. Okay, so that's the first two technical points ticked. If you look at the pole, um, I wonder if I can zoom, there we go, perfect. That pole is absolutely vertical. Okay, now, if it wasn't, that means that that person's shoulders and their upper body isn't square. It phys they physically can't do it. Um, so to, to separate your upper body from your lower body, for, firstly, is a very difficult thing to do um, for a couple of reasons. One, it uh, requires a lot of coordination. It requires a lot of core strength. And it requires um, a lot of upper body strength at the same time. So what we're looking for um, and, and what we try to incorporate into the fitness sessions as well is your upper body discipline, your ability to keep your, the discipline with your upper body to know what your upper body's doing whilst your legs do something else. So whether that is the tuck pulses that we do, whether it's the lateral lunges with our arms above our heads, all that kind of stuff um, is really what we're, what we're looking to build off the hill and it will have a massive impact on the hill. Um, so we're just gonna roll on to that. If you can see the, this picture here, again, same quote, Although you can't win a race because of your upper body and your shoulder position, you can lose a race. Um, so this picture here is one of the under 12s. You can see that her upper body um, is facing down the hill. If her shoulders were to have some kind of light beams or lasers or something, they would be going straight down that hill, um, route one, which is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and again, it's easy for us to say, oh, you know, it's just, just point your shoulders downhill. It is a very, very difficult skill to do. Um, so that, that's keeping your shoulders square. The other thing we need to do um, is keep our shoulders level. So if we look, go back to this picture, this person's shoulders are re reasonably level, but they are somewhat leaning to the inside. Um, see if we've got this picture of Dave. His shoulders there are absolutely level. Same with that one. Okay, so they're both left foot turns. Shoulders are absolutely level. Now, what that does is it allows, it keeps his center of mass, it keeps his basically his balance point over his skis. Um, now, it's difficult on skis because the forces are obviously going different ways. So keeping your shoulders level is a massive, massive point. If you think about rolling your ankles and knees. If you're short, if you're a pencil and your shoulders were to go the same way, you're going to fall inside. Um, I, I guarantee you, every single person on here um, has fallen inside at some point, whether it be on the dry slope, on the indoor, or up on the mountain. I know I have countless times, too many times. <laughs> um, so, yeah, parents especially. If you, this is a really identifiable thing. And you don't need to have any technical knowledge whatsoever. You can look at someone and say, oh, you know, their arms are leaning in, their shoulders are leaning, their inside hands really close to the ground. It, it's, a, it's one of those identifiable things that you have to, you don't have any background to see it. Okay, that person's doing that. Okay, maybe I'll, or you, your son, daughter comes to you and says, oh, did you see that? Yeah, I was, look, look, I don't know anything, look, I don't know anything about skiing, but it looked really good. The only thing I would say is your shoulders or maybe, you know, your inside hand's dropping a little bit. Remember and try and keep your shoulders level. If you, if you were to say, keep your shoulders level, 
you cannot go wrong. Um, and that goes for, for athletes of all levels, of all ages. Um, from under 10s that are just getting into the sport to the World Cup guys um, that, that are skiing, you know, 30, 40 weeks a year. Another example of using an object um, in replacement of your poles. So this is, uh, this is Jono, he's holding a balloon. What's the reason for him holding the balloon? Well, if he didn't have a balloon, some athletes have a tendency to keep their hands too low, to keep the hands too wide, different heights, etc. If you've got a balloon, a football, a, a netball, anything that's that size, um, it just gives you that perfect opportunity to hold something and, and you know you can't let go. Um, so, so coaches out there, um, even parents, if you go to sessions and say, oh, I saw, you know, why don't we try this? Why don't we try that? Um, you know, coaches will, will love bouncing ideas off each other. Um, so using different objects to mix training up, not only does it keep training fun, um, it, it just kind of gives that new dimension to training. Um, so, yeah, looking at it, so far, what have we covered? Your technical points. Once you've rolled your ankles, you want to have your parallel shins. Okay, shins like window wipers, every single turn, right foot, left foot. Your upper body... We want to try and keep your upper body as square as you can. So that means keeping your shoulders facing down the hill. And it means keeping your shoulders level going across the way. Um, with and when it comes to your arms, things like holding footballs, holding basketballs, um, even tennis balls out in front of you are perfect drills um, when it comes to your upper body. Um, so, so what we'll do is, again, we'll do the same thing for questions. If anyone's got any questions... Um, email them to me at the end of this or, or just now um, and the first 10 minutes of next week's session we'll answer all the questions um, about if anyone's got anything about this one so that's the two technical points out the way now we're going to come on to tactical your tactical points so it doesn't matter what level you're at whether you're putting skis on in a start gate for the first time or whether you're about to push out kits bull downhill this applies to absolutely everyone on the call. Um, and it's your course inspections. Everyone will get one. Everyone will do one. Um, so to, to start with, uh, and this might seem a bit basic, but I think it's quite an important thing to do. What, what, what do courses look like? What are, what are hairpins? What are verticales? What are banana gates? I think it's really important that everyone um, is on the same page when it comes to what, what courses look like. Why, why is there why is there six gates up there in that short space? But yet here there's only four gates and these ones, oh, you could draw a ruler, but these ones are, there's big distances. So um, we don't need to get into that. That is that's extremely boring stuff, trust me. So slalom, we're only looking at slalom just now. There's three basic combinations. You've got your hairpin, you've got your verticale, and you've got your banana or your delay gate, sometimes also known as your under gate. Um, now, the next slide, I, hopefully I won't confuse anybody, um, which is why we're going to talk you through it. So on the left-hand side, we've got what slalom used to look like. Um, it used to be two gates. You had to ski through both gates in, offer, in order for it to be classed a legal turn. Okay, so you had to cross this yellow line in order for that turn to be legal. Then you went here, you crossed this yellow line. Okay, nowadays... What they've done is they've taken out the outside gates. Okay, so it looks like this one. Now, the yellow line, or you know, not real, but the yellow line is still there. You still have to cross that yellow line, okay, in order to complete the turn. Okay, that's just standard slalom, single gate slalom. Um, that, that's your kind of bread and butter kind of stuff. So now we're going into the hairpin. Now, this looks really confusing. It actually looks like that game that you used to get where you have to join the boxes up. But maybe that's just me being a bit sad. So um, if you look at the one on the left, it explains what we do on the right. So this time we're going to go through. We have to cross the green lines. Okay, so we go through here, through the red one, through the blue. Now, this is your hairpin. We still have to cross the, the lines. Okay, so instead of the gates being across the way, the gates are just up and down the way. So we're going to come through like that. Okay, so I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, hopefully. Um, 
And all we're doing is breaking that barrier for crossing the line. It's just a case of the gates have been taken from going across the way to going up and down the way. So if we go to the far right, um, it's our single gate slalom. You come in, imagine that green line is still there. You cross it. You're going to cross the green line and through the hairpin, through the hairpin again. And, and it, it leaves the question, what's the point of this bottom gate in a hairpin? And often um, coaches will say, oh, that's the bogey gate. Or oh, that, just leave that gate. That, that's the banana. That's just trying to catch you out. And it's true. But it has to be there so you can cross between those two gates. Okay, so a hairpin is just in, one quick turn, and out. Okay, so I'll email these slides out afterwards to anyone who wants them. Um, uh, and it's hopefully that, that's cleared up what a hairpin is. Um, so next time you're at a race or, or whatever, because it is incredibly daunting the way people talk about races. Um, so the next one's your verticale. I've got no idea how to spell it. Um, any, uh, any opinions would be greatly appreciated. So all your verticale is, is a double hairpin, if you think about it. So here we go with your classic slalom, your old school slalom. You've got to ski between the gates. So between the two blue ones, between the two red ones, you're then going to go between the two blues, between the two reds, between the two blues again, and out, that's you finished. So the hairpin was in and out. The verticale is in, one, out. So it's in, one turn, and out. Okay, so it's almost like two, actually. Um, and it's exactly the same principle. You've got to break the plane or break the line. If you look at this one, the green line, um, it's exactly the same as your classic slalom. It's just not got an outside gate. We're going to come round, cross the green line, and you've just got to break that green line, go through that green line um, in order for you to ski a hairpin correctly. Um, so if we were to look at direction change um, on the far right one, all that does is it's exactly the same principle. You would be breaking the green line, breaking the green line. We're coming in and out and straight out the other side. Um, so hairpins are one double gate. Verticales are two double gates. You do get a royal flush, which is three double gates. Um, they're, they're pretty rare nowadays, but it does happen. It's exactly the same principle. You've got to break the line of the red gate and the blue gate. In the red gate, it's just exactly the same thing. So they're your vertical combinations, your vertical gates. The next one is your banana gate, the lay gate, under gate, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're all exactly the same thing. The difference between a banana gate or delay and a vertical combination, so your hairpin and your verticale, is that the delay gate goes across the hill. So the aim of a delay is to take an athlete from one side of a slope or one side of a lane across to the other side. Um, if we were to look at it, it's fairly straightforward. If you imagine you've got a corridor of gates, so it's just red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, the whole way down. The only difference is if it goes red, blue, red, blue, the banana gate is going to go red, blue on the same foot. So it's one turn around two gates. Um, normally it's about kind of 25, 30% longer than a normal slalom turn. It could be up to 15 meters um, or 18 for the older guys. So the difference between a normal gate and a banana gate is on a normal gate, you do one turn around one gate. On a banana gate, you do one turn around two gates. It is, it's that simple. Um, and it comes down to the, the same thing as before with the old school slalom. Um, about having to go through two gates and you, and you break the line. So if we, you know, that, back to this one where you have to break that line there, the delay gate has got that exact same thing. Imagine there's a line going between these two blue, uh, blue gates where the cursor is just now, my cursor is. You just got to go through that plane, through that line. So it's a case of one turn round two gates. Um, so so hopefully that, that's cleared up most things up. Um, it, it is really difficult. At the end of the day, it all comes down to experience. Um, the more you train, the more you race, the more questions you ask, you know, oh, is that a hairpin or is that a vertical? Is that, is that a banana gate or is that a hairpin? And, and you know, we, we get it all the time. And it is amazing when people can come to us and say, oh, you know, that, that hairpin there, 
that, that, that looks pretty tight or oh that hairpin there that looks that looks good that that banana gate there that's a, that's a big turn is it not so so for us as coaches you know don't, don't be scared to ask these kind of questions um it, it's all about learning um athletes parents and other coaches um it's all about learning the learning process for the athletes for parents as well um it, yeah it, it's all a, a big learning process so that, that's what we're looking at um in courses so we're going to go back to christy just for a minute um and ask uh, the question i've got for you christy is what if you were to do a course inspection let, let's stick to slalom slalom and gs for now if you were to do a course inspection, what are you, what are you looking for? What what kind of things are you are you after? Okay, so um, if I was looking at uh, so generally between slalom and giant slalom, there's a few kind of key things I would be looking at. So just in general, I would kind of look at the terrain. So where are the steeps? Where are the flats? Where are the fallways? Um, and how might this affect perhaps what line I would be looking to take. So particularly when going from steep to flat, um, we'd be looking to hold a slightly higher line to allow ourselves to carry speed onto the flat, or perhaps we want to let the line go a little bit and try and carry as much speed as we can across the flat. You've obviously got to match that up with the course set like at that particular point in turn. But yeah, terrain is a really big one especially with the following as well. So um, a lot of people who are on the call probably raced in Gormio and we know there was a really, really strong um, follow-away uh, on the right footer, right footer, I think. Yeah. Um, so obviously if there's any follow there, I'm thinking about, right, well, on those turns, I've got to make sure that I have that, what Fraser was talking about early, earlier about that center mass. I really want to make sure that my center mass is over my skis there. So that takes some adjustments. So I want to really note where that is. Um, I might also be looking at the snow conditions as well in general, so particular places in the course. So usually things like the shade and the sun. So how might that affect the snow conditions? Um, is it bumpy? Is it icy in particular places? And that all affects what Fraser was talking about, about your platform as well. So we want to make sure, especially if we've got bumpy sections or icy sections, that our platform is really, really solid. So we can take that all into consideration when we're approaching how we're going to ski that section of the course. The, the um, snow conditions like might obviously not be consistent from top to bottom as well. So it's just making sure that I've got it clear um, in my head what's going on at each kind of stage in, in the course. Um, also as well, like I would be saying to athletes as well that we're just generally looking for places in the course where we can get faster. So where in the course can we let our skis go and, and really let them run and try and, and carry our speed? Or where in the course might it be really good to, um, to adjust our line um, or our body position to try and um, make sure that we're holding on to our speed? Um, where can we grab a tuck? Um, and always as well in terms of looking for places where we can get faster is having a plan for the start and the finish. So having a plan for coming out the start gate. Am I wanting to skate here? Am I wanting to, to glide? What, what am I wanting to do? So making sure that I've got that plan. Um, and also the finish line. So from the last gate to the finish line, there's always more time to make more speed. So how do we do that? Do we tuck? Do we lean forward? Do we shoot forward with our hand or our pole? Or what are we doing there to try and generate some, or to try and make some more time? And I think like that that's just kind of general, but also like particularly in Salem, like all of those combinations that Fraser's spoken about, we want to be looking at those combinations because some can be tighter and some can be more open. Some can possibly be set slightly diagonal. Some can be set as we come over onto a steep place. Some can be set as we go down onto the flat. So we want to look at what are the combinations that are in the course and where are they? And how does that perhaps change what we might do with our line um, in terms of carrying speed through the course and making it flow? And remember that combinations usually or pretty much always are an indication that there's a rhythm change. So a combination is usually set by a coach to um, either um, make the course, to allow the course to become slightly more turny afterwards, or perhaps to become slightly less turny afterwards, um, or to run out onto the flat, or to perhaps control speed when you're on the steep as well. So a combination obviously needs to be inspected, but it also indicates that there's going to be a change after that. So just knowing where the combinations are is really important. And I think that there will almost always be, and I know that a, a good course setter likes to allow for a really nice flow in the course from top to bottom, 
But in order to provide some challenge, there will always be in all courses, some gates that are set there to provide that challenge. So you want to say to yourself or you want to ask your coach, where are the gates that I need to know about? Where are the gates that are going to challenge me? And is that going to be perhaps a blind gate that you that we maybe can see an inspection, but when we're skiing it, we're in our low skiing position and we can't actually see where that is over the, over the rise? Or is it perhaps a quirky combination um, or a gate that particularly stands out as being against the rhythm, maybe perhaps because the course setters wanted to avoid a particular patch of snow or wants to, as Fraser says, move the athlete, move the athletes over onto a different side of the piece. So there's always a gate that, that you want to know about, a particular gate that sticks out against the, the general rhythm of the course. So where, where are they and how do we adjust what we're doing? So yeah, I think for course inspection, that's really the main things, I guess, like just the terrain steep to flat, uh, the snow conditions, is it consistent, a plan for where I might be able to make more speed um, and also any rhythm changes or gates that might, might, catch, might catch us out or that have been set there to provide a little bit of challenge. Um, another really important thing, I, I don't want to take up too much time, Fraser, but I was just going to mention visualization or is that something that you're going to talk about later or? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We're, we're going to bring it in in a second. Um, I'll come back to you in about 32 and a half seconds. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think one of the, the main points that, that Christy said, and, and it's so important, no one, no one does it. Course inspection starts from the start of a, of a course. The amount of times that the athletes have slipped down to maybe the second or the third gate and going, oh yeah, you know, that's a red gate, that's a, that's a blue one. And then you stand in the start gate and you go, oh my goodness, that gate's all the way over there and I've got to get over, how am I going to get from there to the, oh my goodness. And, and it's, it's such an important point. Um, and to start right from the very beginning when it comes to course inspection. Um, so yes, you need to, Look at yourself. Inspection is normally 30 minutes for, for you guys that are older. Um, your speed inspection, super gene downhill, can go up to an hour and a half, sometimes hour and 45. Um, what course inspection does is it allows you to, yeah, Chris is on it. You're, you're, it allows you to visualize yourself in different situations. So we look at a course and we say, okay, you know, there's, there's 10 gates here that are in a rhythm. Okay, no, so in these 10 gates, I'm just going to roll my ankles. I'm just going to put my knees in. And I'm going to make sure I keep my shoulders facing down the hill. Okay, then what happens? Oh, then there's a really steep rollover. And it just gives you these points um, to really visualize what you are going to do in your race run. You know, you get one shot at it, sometimes two. Um, it gives you that opportunity to look at it and say, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to put my skis there. I'm going to roll my ankles and I'm going to pull plant here. I'm going to, you know, push here. I'm going to ski a really good line down this steep section here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just throw it back over to you, Christy, about the, the visualization. Yeah, sorry. So I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time and, and sort of like ramble on about something that's maybe not that interesting. Something that was really interesting uh, for me as a coach was that somebody showed me a study once and it's to do with your pinky finger. So basically they had a group of people and for a certain section of this group of people, they said, you're gonna do nothing. We're gonna measure the strength in your pinky finger and you're gonna do nothing for the next, I can't remember how long it was, maybe about a month. To another group of people, they said, um, we're gonna measure the strength of your pinky finger and we're gonna give you specific pinky finger strength and conditioning exercises to do. And then we're gonna measure you again at the end. And then they said to another group of people, we're going to measure the strength of your pinky finger and we're going to give you some exercises that you're going to complete in your head, but you're not actually going to do anything. And then we're going to measure you again, again at the end. And basically, interestingly, the results of the study um, were to back up the benefits of visualization because it showed that obviously the people who did the strength and conditioning exercises, their pinky became stronger. For the people that did nothing, there was no change in the strength of their pinky finger. But the most notable part of the study was that for the people who did the mind exercises for their pinky finger, they showed some improvement in the strength in their pinky finger. So we know that visualization in sport and movement in developing muscle memory and creating pathways from our brain to our muscles to complete particular actions, we know that it works. So when you see people visualizing, perhaps in the start gate of the World Cup, or maybe you've seen it even at, at races, you've seen some people 
in the finish line going through the course in their head. So really actually visualize yourself, not just the pattern of gates, but to really actually visualize yourself going through that pattern of gates. Research tells us that that's actually a really beneficial thing to do. And more important than necessarily thinking about exactly where the gates are, it's important to think about what your body might do as you go through those gates. So is there a particular quirky corset or a gate that you maybe don't ski very often? So something like perhaps like a really long under gate or a combination that's set backwards or maybe a hairpin straight into another hairpin or something that we see rarely, but it does happen. It would be beneficial for you to imagine yourself actually going through that, that pattern of gates and really emphasizing what your body movements might do there because research tells us that that it actually works in terms of um, perhaps making those um, signals that go from our brain to our body more more efficient and more effective so yeah that was just something I thought I'd share yeah yeah definitely I mean that, that's a, it's a huge point you if you watch the skin on the telly you see these guys in the world cup um you know they're, they're huddled over the poles their eyes are closed and they're visualizing with their hands what what line they're going to take they're, they're visualizing how fast they're going to be going, what positions they're going to be in, um, which leads me on to the next question, um, which is actually the last question in this slide. So we'll just run through this. We'll be done in five minutes. So why did they do course inspections? It's a safety thing, but it's also a, a level playing field thing. So it gives it gives everyone the opportunity to ski to see the course before they ski it. Um, what can and you cannot do? So you can't ski the course inspection. Um, but you can side slip it. You can side slip the line nine times out of 10. Um, you can visualize the position that you'll be in. Um, you can actually ski in bits in sections in Super G and Dino, but that's a story for another day. So what, what should you be doing? Christy's covered everything. Um, it's a fourth point here. Imagine what you're going to be doing. Look at the tricky gates. You know, there, there's going to be three or four gates in a course that you think, oh, that's going to be a really difficult one. Take an extra 30 seconds and think, Okay, so if I just aim for, you know, I'm going to aim for that bit there and I'm going to really roll my ankles on. And when I pass this gate, I'm going to be aiming so far above the next one, it's going to set me up until the finish. Um, and the last question on this page is, do I need to remember every single gate? And the, the, the question that is written with it, I'm sure most of you are thinking, what on earth is, is Fraser doing? The question is, is, do you like cheese? I love cheese. Um, uh, and I'm sure half the people on this call do, and I'm sure half the people on this call don't, um, that there is absolutely no answer to that. It, everyone is different, and it all comes with experience. It's the last slide that we're, we're going to get through tonight. Um, everyone is different. The, the, if you're skiing super gene downhill, yes, you probably want to know every gate. Slalom and GS, there are so many different things you can do. What, what I used to do um, was break it up into sections. So... We're going to take a slalom. Okay, so you know I've got I've got rhythm section that's not too turny. I can really push it. Then I've got a tight hairpin before it goes onto a steep. So I know, right, that hairpin, I've really got to get the line because I'm going to go onto the steep. Okay, what next? Hmm. Well, I've got a rhythm section of 18 to 20 gates. Okay, you know, I'm just going to hammer that section, ski the line, do the basics, get to the bottom. Oh, I've got a really, really, really tight under gate. Okay, so what do you remember from the course? And you're in the start and you're thinking, Oh, okay, so I've got seven, I've got seven gates, then I've got one hairpin, or is it eight gates and a hairpin? Ah, oh, it could be 10 gates and a banana. And a... All you need is two to three cues. So you're in the start gate and you think, okay, as soon as I hit that first hairpin, I'm going to ski the line. When I'm at that gate, my skis are going to be aiming so high. Once I get off the, the steep, I'm going to let the skis go into that, uh, into that banana gate. Once I hit that banana gate, it is full steam to the finish. I am just going to pull the string and, and I'm going to go. Um, two to three points per course um, is all you need and I guarantee you when you get to the bottom you'll still forget what's just happened um, so it, it brings us on to the, the last slide sections of rhythm um, they're, they're known as corridors you'll be able to notice one as soon as you look up a hill and you think oh that looks good there's literally just a train track of gates um, that's called a corridor a funnel it starts wider at the top and, and gradually gets narrower towards the bottom or the other way around. Um, it gradually gets wider. So, so they're the kind of things that, that you can look at. Um, terrain, Christy mentioned terrain. The rolls that are in the piece, the bumps that you're going to have to deal with. If you're racing speed, it's going to be your jumps. If you're skiing on a dry slope, 
it's going to be the matting. Is there an old piece of matting that's got a right foot turn on it that you're going to have to set up for maybe a little bit more? Snow surface. Has it rained the night before? Is it, you know, um, is it really, really icy towards the top half, but not so much in the bottom half? Um, these are all the, the kind of data points, if you want, um, all the things to look at for your, your course inspections. Um, I, if it was me, if it was us, sorry, we, we've come away with two or three points per course, and it's just keep it really simple. That first hairpin, I'm going to really come under that one. I'm going to really set up for the steep, okay? What are you going to do after that? Well, I'm going to come to that uh, banana gate, the one that's near the finish. Okay, right. What are you going to do after that? Well, once I get through that banana gate, it, it's pretty simple to the bottom. So I'm just going to put my head down and I'm really going to attack. Okay, next thing you know, the one goes closed uh, and you're off. Um, all, all this about measuring distances and how many gates, oh, it's just seven gates before this, eight gates. It, it's all extra information that, that we don't need. Um, the, the best thing to do, keep it simple. Um, and the most important message of the night, um, it all comes with experience. Once you ski, you know, 10,000 courses on dry slope, on indoor, on up in the mountains, you will know, okay, that gate there, is a, that is a really tricky one. I'm really going to have to set up for that one. Or you'll know, oh, I tell you what, this section here is in a straight line. I'm going to, you know, put my head between my legs and just go for this next 10 gates. Um, it all comes to experience. So we're going to be done in 25 seconds. We are going to recap what we've done. So we spoke about the progression of the knee. We've got, so now we're rolling the ankles. The knee's gone in. The key, key points, you want to see shins like window wipers. Um, that's all we're looking for. Shins like window wipers every single turn. Slam GS, Super G downhill. Onto the upper body. You want to keep your shoulders square facing down the hill. And looking at them laterally, so looking at the cross away, you want your shoulders to be level. Um, if your shoulders are level, then you're going to be allowed to really create that speed and get the bend in the ski like the one that's in the photograph just now. Moving forward, we looked at the tactical approach to ski racing. So hopefully now everyone would feel comfortable saying, that's a hairpin, I know what way I'm going to ski around that, or that's a verticale, that, that's an undergate, banana gate, delay gate. I know what way. Um, little Jimmy's going to ski around that um, when, he, when he comes to the finish in his race. Um, so we've looked at courses. We've looked at course inspection, um, keeping everything simple, not overcomplicating it. It's a fantastic opportunity to look at a course and think, okay, these are the three things I'm going to do and I'll see you at the bottom. Um, so, yeah, that, that's all we've got um, for this week. Next week, we are going to look at race days in particular, so a little bit about the psychology of race days, um, the layout of race days, why they are different, if they are different, um, to training days, why they're different, why it should be different, why it shouldn't be different. Um, and also two more technical points. So we're going to look at introducing the hip into ski racing and one other as well that will go out on the email. So if anyone's got any questions, um, Feel free to email me, fraser at britskiacad.org.uk, and we will spend the first 10 minutes of the next session rolling through the questions. Um, hopefully someone has, or everyone has taken something away um, from the last 40 minutes or so. Sorry about the, the technical stuff at the bottom. Massive thanks to Christy um, for joining us for the 45 minutes. It's been awesome. Um, and yeah, hopefully everyone's learned something and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you, Fraser. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, Christy. <laughs>